Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's good to be back at uh, Eller. I do have a long relationship with Eller, even though I went to school at ASU. Boo. <laughs> it's okay. You'll feel better about me once I get to the story. Um, so I'm Henry Corral. I'm with Intel Corporation. Uh, I've been with Intel a really long time, 28 years. And uh, I now work in our global diversity and inclusion group, right? But I'll be honest with you, 27 of my 28 years have not been in the global diversity organization um, proper and um, have not been in HR, okay? I'm a finance guy, right? And, and so I started Intel uh, in accounting in 1987, in the accounting group, uh, moved into um, finance, uh, operations slash corporate finance, with my logic being I wanted to see the money before it was spent versus after it was spent. So I moved into finance, right? Um, and and had, a, had, a, had a wonderful career in finance. And worked my way up uh, the chain, if you will, at, um, at Intel, within Intel Finance, and, and kind of the last decade or so of my career in finance were great. I moved to, to Shanghai, China. Me and my entire family, we moved to China. And uh, I was the site controller, so the China country controller, if you will, um, for our uh, first manufacturing venture in, in China, right? And that was great. Living in Shanghai was a, was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I came home for a little bit of time, but I went right back to Asia and I, I uh, lived in Penang, Malaysia. And we had a huge manufacturing operations. It has huge, uh, what we call back-end assembly test manufacturing operations in, um, in Malaysia. And I became the site uh, controller there as well for a few years. Um, I then came back to the States. And, and when I came back um, to the US, right, I, I heard, I, I remember being in a finance, uh, we call them bums, it's a business update meeting, okay? And I remember hearing these two words that I had never heard before in my career growing up in Intel US, right? And I will tell you that growing up in Intel US as the only Latino, right, that I could see around me uh, in finance, right? There was one Hispanic, me, one African American, a buddy of mine named Ken, um, and that's it, right? That, that's all there was. And so I came back uh, after being really out of the country for about four and a half years or so, came back, attended this business update meeting, and heard these two words that I had never heard before. One was diversity, and one was inclusion, right? And I had to pinch myself and say, you know, where the hell am I, right? We don't talk about that stuff here at Intel, right? And so this was about 2002-ish, okay, or so. And so I remember thinking that I needed to get involved with uh, diversity and inclusion, and I did. You know, I became a, a core member of our diversity MRC for finance, and it's, you know, fast forward 10 years, I, I became a champion of diversity in finance um, and kind of said, hey, what if I made this my day job, right? What if I made championing diversity efforts and making Intel a more inclusive place to work what if I made that my day job and, and really left my controllership, right? And by this time, I was managing um, an organization of about $2 billion in spending, uh, about seven countries, right? So it was a great job, a lot of scope, people uh, reporting to me from all over the world. Um, and you know what? I, I did it, right? So about a year ago, I took a huge left turn in my career and moved into uh, corporate diversity, right? And, and it's, so, it, it's so, I'm now essentially an individual contributor. Right? So I have no staff, per se, working for me. Um, and I was so lost. I had been so spoiled at Intel of, of having my organization help me do things or accomplish things I wanted to accomplish, having a, an administrative assistant who was wonderful and could help me with anything. When I got to be an individual contributor, I didn't even know how to book a conference room at Intel. I didn't know how to set up a bridge. I didn't know how to book a flight, nothing. Right? So, so it, was a, it was a learning experience from many, many different vectors, right? Not to mention um, the cultural differences just between finance and now HR, okay? So uh, in that perspective, you know, I'm very, very loyal to Intel because of the opportunities that they've given me, right? I'm, I'm born and raised, one of the few born and raised in Arizona, 
Okay, small copper mining town, probably about halfway between here and Phoenix, right? A little town called Kearney of about 2,000 people, right? And to have someone, small town boy, wake up one day living in Shanghai, you know, managing that country from a finance perspective, uh, leaves me with a lot of loyalty um, to Intel Corporation. And now, you know, even this far in my career, they've allowed me an opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to leave finance behind me, go try and and leave a legacy in this, in this new diversity journey that we're on. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, is this, is this diversity journey. Um, and, and even bigger than, than from an Intel uh, context, but from a, from a high-tech perspective, right? Um, and it, it's been in the news a lot in the last 18 to 24 months, the um, diversity in high-tech or lack of diversity in high-tech, right? Um, and women in gaming and all these kinds of things that We'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, today, okay? So that's me, and um, you know, thank you to Gandhi for uh, inviting me. It's my pleasure to, to be here. One of the things I didn't mention is, is you know, I talked to you about the ASU um, thing. I came down here about 22 years ago. Um, a, a, a colleague of mine, who's now a VP at Intel, um, had gone to school here, and he says, "Hey, we're going to go down to to Tucson to go do a recruiting." event for finance, right? Do you want to go? I said, sure, I'll go. Um, you know, probably they wanted to highlight how many Hispanics we had in finance, right? And it was me. So they said, let's take all of them. So they took all of them. <laughs> and it was me, right? And, but I, I tell you what, I, I, I fell in love from that very first day. I fell in love with Eller and the sense of community that exists here. And I could tell that the faculty and the administration was very vested in, in every student, right? And I'll be honest with you, I didn't quite feel that at ASU, so I felt a little more corporate to me. And so I have been involved with the college um, for those 22 years, and I've actually been on the, um, the Eller National Board of Advisors for about the last 12 years, I think. I've, I've been on the board, right? So I do have lots of, lots of experience here uh, down at, at Eller, okay? Okay, so, so, um, you know, we think about, and, and by the way, questions are, are welcome as I go through this, right? We think about, about diversity and, and, and what it means, and, and all of us play in diversity, right? Whether you, whether you think you do or not, all of us deal with diversity. Diversity of, of culture, diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of experiences, etc. right? It, it, every one of us brings something unique to any situation that we're in, right? And really what the intent of this is trying to do is trying to tap into that and get the best of all of you, get the best of all of, for me, all of our Intel employees that we can, right? Um, and, and you do that by um, tapping into those, to that uniqueness, to those different uh, skills and attributes and experiences that you bring to the table and really utilizing those for whatever it is you're trying to produce, right? Be it a high-tech um, product, uh, be it a piece of clothing, whatever the case may be, okay? And so at Intel, you know, today Intel is a very different Intel than I grew up in, right? The Intel that I grew up in, we made really big chips, right, um, that were really expensive, and we sold a ton of them, right, and made a lot of money doing it, right? And, and, and that was about it. That was the model. Right, whatever you do, whatever analysis you want to do, don't mess with that golden goose, okay? D don't ever touch that, okay? And let's try and innovate and let's try and do some other things. But at the end of the day, everything came down to selling really high quality, fast, top of the line chips. And, and we use this, um, how many of you have heard of uh, Moore's, Moore's Law, right? So we use that and that's, a, that's a, something that we live by every day and it's saying we're going to double the amount of transistors on a die every 18 to 24 months, right? And, and that gets really, it has gotten really, really challenging, right? And you uh, folks who are probably a little more technical in nature than me probably understand the, um, the black magic of that more than I do for sure, okay? But it, so, so that's the intel I grew up in. Now fast forward to today, right? I would never in my life imagine that I would see intel at a New York fashion design show showcasing how we can bring Intel technology into wearable 
um, products, right? As an example, right? So we can't think with that same mentality that we had of, um, you know, just keep making these things faster and better and we can make a lot of money. We can't think like that anymore, right? We have to think about what can the consumer afford to pay? What does the consumer need? Um, sometimes the consumer doesn't even know what he or she needs at any point in time, right? So in order for us to do that, we need to be much more innovative than we ever have been, right? And to do that, we need to have a workforce that reflects society more so than it has in the past, right? And so that's what we'll talk about. That, that is the challenge, right? Is how do we make our workforce reflect what's out there in society today in the United States, in China, in India, in Africa, wherever, wherever it may be, right? How do we go and do that? And, and it's, it's not easy, right? Moving the, lead, moving the needle one percentage point, right, is very, very, very difficult, okay? So our, our vision, right, if it's, um, if it's smart and it's connected, it's best with Intel, period, right? That's a very ubiquitous kind of statement that says anything that has technology in it, right, that's what we mean by smart, anything that has technology in it works better with Intel, period, okay? And so that's a, that, that's a, um, that's a huge statement. And, you know, I'm sure that you all know that our technology today is now, you know, we're inside all kinds of Internet of Things technology. We're inside wearables we talked about earlier. We're inside PCs, of course, tablets, laptops, phones, not as, much, not as many phones as we'd like to be in, but phones for sure, right? So this is the vision, right? And this is the base of where we say our diversity needs are born from this statement, okay? Having a bunch of type A, um, type A personalities in a room, right, who all kind of think alike, isn't gonna get you that best innovation, right? Served us very well in the past. It's not gonna serve us too well going forward, okay? So, um, last year, okay? Last year, this is, this is Brian Kurzanich. He's our uh, CEO, right? We lovingly call him BK, right? And BK's kind of grown up um, in, in Intel's manufacturing realm through the years. And when he became CEO, he, he is, um, uh, he shook things up, right? He's made some bold statements and some bold commitments um, internally as well as externally, right? So I'll, I'll let you read that real quick. But the very last sentence says that, that you know, having a workforce that is representative of the communities in which we s serve and support, right, is critical. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier, okay? So he came out and said, he came out and said that um, the, the high-tech industry is not as diverse as it needs to be, right? Embarrassingly not as a, di a diverse as it needs to be, okay? And so what you saw was a, a huge, this was uh, early 2014-ish, uh, right? You saw lots of press, right? Um, I think it was driven by the fact that Google had published some numbers, right? Google had published some numbers saying they're only 20, 20 to 25% female, okay, in the high-tech industry, right? And so... Um, you know, lack of diversity could undercut tech problems uh, are even worse at the leadership level, et cetera, et cetera. All of which, by the way, are 100% true, okay? I will tell you that, that as a function of, of this, right, um, more and more companies have started releasing their data, right? This is data that companies in the high-tech industry have historically held very, very close to the vest. Right? We don't want the world to know that we're only one-fourth of our workforce is women, for example. Right? Less than 3% are African-American. Right? We, don't, we don't want anyone to know that. Intel, I will tell you, that over longer than the last decade, we have been released. This is all public information that we uh, report publicly and have for the last at least 10, 15 years. Okay? So something that we haven't ever hid behind and something that we've said for a long time we want to be a diverse workforce. But I will tell you, once again, I mentioned that 
moving the needle is really, really tough, right? So if you look at, if you look at our history, right, if you look at, um, and, and this is probably the high tech in general, right? In 2000, we were probably about 24% female, 76% male, right? We put a ton of programs in place, lots of hiring efforts to go and hire women, lots of women's programs, etc. Fast forward 10, 15 years, we're 24% female, 76% male, right? The needle hardly, hasn't hardly moved at all, right? So as such, um, uh, let me, before I go there, as such, um, BK came out in, at, at, at the Consumer Electronics Show, right, which is like the showcase show for the high-tech industry, happens in Vegas every year, just happened a couple weeks ago, actually, for 2016. But he came out last year and said, made this bold statement for Intel that says, by the year 2020, our workforce is going to be at parity in terms of representation, okay? And so let me, let me explain what that means at parity, right? So the way companies measure parity is they look at who's coming out of the universities, right? What is the percent of the population? And for us, we're 85% technical workforce, right? So it, it, it's very representative of the company, right? So if at, let's say that the University of Arizona was the only school around for 1,000 miles, right? And the University of Arizona had 30% technical female graduating, right? We would say that that is our goal. We want our goal to be where our pipeline is coming from to be at parity with the University of Arizona, okay, in terms of technical. Same thing, we look at same thing for um, what we call our underrepresented minorities, which is Hispanic, right? So same thing, if, if University of Arizona, Arizona is, is graduating 10% um, technical Hispanics, we want to match that, right? And be at, at, at a minimum at parity with that. Same with African Americans, another class in this underrepresented minority, as well as Native Americans, okay? So that's what we mean by full representation by 2020, okay? At that time in five years, we want to get there, um, and, and, and that is, will take some work, right? I talked to you about the decade of work prior to that with not a lot of movement, and now we've made these bold goals, okay? And so, so why do we want to do this, right? I talked to you about the innovation, right? But there, there's some facts out there, some studies that have been done that said firms with the highest level of racial diversity generated 15 times more sales, okay? That's significant. That's not a little bit more sales. 15x more sales, right? Firms with females in the C-suite generated $44 million more in revenue on average. And I don't know the size of the, the firms we're talking about here, but $44 million is $44 million, right? And a 57% increase in, in performance against goals, right? So, there's, so there's, there's data and study that suggest that diversity has a powerful effect on business impact, right? And, and that's the business case, right? And we do it because it's the right thing to do and, and we want to have a representative workforce. But from a business perspective, there's also... Uh, data that suggests that there's a good business case in doing this as well, right? Not to mention the innovation, which we, we haven't quite measured, the innovation that you bring about by having a more diverse workforce, okay? So there's, there's, there's goodness all the way around if we get this to happen, all right? So diversity and inclusion lifts, lifts teams in three ways, right? Improves problem solving and creativity, um, I talked about that groupthink, right? If you have a, a bunch of folks who all look the same and kind of have the same background, you're probably going to get a, an okay answer, but it's probably not going to be the, a comprehensive answer, right? Or an answer that comprehends all possibilities, right? And that it raises team intelligence, right? If I look at, just look at this, just look at this room, right? There's lots of diversity in this room, and I bet some of you have felt that in your study groups, right? That people bring different perspectives to the table, different than yours, and that's the beauty of a, of a upper level education, right? That's the beauty of it, is getting perspectives other than that of your own. So apply that same concept in a business case, and that's simply what we're trying to do, and that's simply the journey that we're, we're, we're heading towards, okay? So, like I mentioned, our goal. 
is to hit full representation uh, by 2020, right? And so that means for every job category that we have that we would um, measure on what is available, right? What's available in the market by looking at all the colleges and universities that we recruit from around the country, right? Because we do from around the country and look at uh, graduation rates and the uh, profile of, of the graduating classes and say that is, um, that is matching those equals parity for us in each of those cases, okay? And it's something that we do every single year. So, a huge, bold statement, right? I, I had just joined this group, by the way. I had just joined uh, HR and Diversity when, when BK um, made this statement, right? And so it, it uh, I, I don't think the timing could have been better, right? <laughs> because it really up-leveled um, what we were trying to do as a, as a global um, uh, diversity organization and also put a lot of focus on on what we were trying to do and, and gave us a lot of support, right? I think what, what happens in a lot of these companies is you have, you have senior uh, leadership who says, yeah, absolutely, let's go do that. That's the right thing to do, right? You have folks down here who are living every day in this non-inclusive world saying, we have to go do that. We have to make this more inclusive or I'm going to another company, right? But then you have this, I'm sure you've heard the term frozen middle, right? The frozen middle that's really, really tough to move and ingrained in what they do every day, right? So trying to defrost that frozen middle and get them into um, practicing every day more inclusive management, more inclusive leadership um, is, is a huge, huge undertaking. So what else did we do? We did other things, right? We put our money where our mouth is as a company. Not just saying this is what we're gonna go do in hiring. We also made a $300 million investment, right? So BK committed $300 million to go and um, to go and help support that diversity ecosystem, if you will, right? So everything from investing in our pre-college students, right? So right now we have a school in Oakland that we're, we're working with, introducing them into STEM, right? Introducing the STEM, working with them, introducing their parents to STEM so that they know from these um, you know, underprivileged neighborhoods and stuff, showing them that this is what STEM is. And it's not, it's hard, but it's not scary. And you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be afraid of it, right? We have a group in, um, we, just, we just did an event in Austin, right? For, um, it's called Con Mi Madre, which means with my mother, okay? And it's a, it's a mainly Hispanic, but also African American, single mothers, right? So it's trying to show the mothers and their kids that STEM is not scary. And STEM is something that you should go, you know, engage in and encourage your kids to go um, and, and work on, right? So all the way from that level, high school level, we're, um, we have probably 150 scholars that we support on technical degrees from undergrad to MBA to PhD or master's degree to PhD. The other thing that we're doing in this space is supplier diversity, right? So we want to ensure that by, two, by 2020 that we are spending a billion dollars of what we spend every year goes to diverse companies, right? Be they you know, Hispanic owned, African American owned, LGBT owned, whatever the case may be, that a billion dollars of our spending is going to those companies. Our spending in 2014 to those companies was 150 million, right? So we've got to grow that quite a bit to make that reality by 2020, okay? But we do that. We engage ourselves with, uh, you know, the human rights campaign, the minority-owned business uh, consortium that exists, um, and, and that's uh, part of what we do. Okay, so our journey so far, right? So in the hiring space, right? One of the things that we said was, um, yeah, having a, having a goal for 2020 is great, and you've got to have that, something to kind of measure yourself towards, but we needed some short-term goals as well, right? And so we said that um, for 2015, that 40% of our hires had to be 
uh, female and or Hispanic, African American, Native American, okay? 40% of our hires, right? Traditionally, it's been probably a little more than half of that, all right? So it, it, was, it was a, and I can tell you, because I work with some of these diversity staffing folks, a Herculean effort to try and accomplish that, right? I'm happy to tell you that we did 43%. We just finished up 2015. 43% uh, of our, of our um, hiring was in these under, upper, underrepresented um, groups, okay? The next one is um, progression and retention. And, and I tell you what, this is the hardest one. This is really, really the hardest one, right? Because at, at the time when we're, we're bringing in 43% diverse employees, right? At the same time, we're trying to build a more inclusive experience once you're inside the company, right? We want to have an experience where you and your manager have a really, really good heartfelt relationship. It's not just he or she telling you, I need this, this, and this done, right? Go do it and then, you know, we want that relation to be, I understand what motivates you, I understand what makes you happy, I understand what gets you excited in the morning when you come to work, right? Um, you know, you can get even deeper than that on uh, your kids and stuff like that, but it's more about what you need as an employee and why you come to work here and how can we make you feel happy and challenged every single day, right? So that's an example of inclusive leadership, right? Having your employees know that they're more than just a resource, right? But they're an individual, a person, etc., right? So, and, and that's not easy to do, right? So as we go out and hire, you know, 400 um, employees, right, underrepresented employees, and then we lose 350 out the back door, right? That, that doesn't serve us well at all, right? So this is, this is the toughest one, right? So, so to combat that, right, we, we've introduced um, a, a few programs, right? There, there's a program that we introduced about five years ago called uh, Blueprint, okay? Uh, Blueprint for Extraordinary Success. We call it Blueprint. And it's a program where we bring in an external um, vendor, right? And um, she comes in and talks about what it takes to be successful and not to be complacent and to go out and ask for what you want and go and have these open conversations with your manager. And it's a nine-month series, and it has been absolutely successful, right? Promotion rates for the folks who have gone through that are double that of folks who haven't, right? Retention rates... Um, for those folks are, uh, once again, about double for those who don't go through that, right? So we're trying to, okay, how do we, how do we release that in a, in a bigger way, right? We've got to go bigger and faster, right? We've just introduced um, two brand new entire curriculum for the company. One is called Lead, one is called Grow, and it's all the way from Diversity 101, right? So when you come in the door, you're going to get some uh, understanding of expectations and, and our culture, all the way to, we send our executives to Stanford, right? For some executive, and, and our diversity and inclusive principles are built into that curriculum and everywhere in between, okay? So um, we, we do that as well. And, and it's, it's gone well, right? Probably not as quickly as we'd like to. We'd like to do everything yesterday, right? But it's a journey, right? I will tell you that this diversity work is a journey. It's not, it's not a task, right? It's a journey. We also have, I, I, I didn't mention earlier, but we also have in these um, communities now, right, we not only include what I've been talking about, women and Hispanic and African American, we have veterans, right? We now have a veterans community that we go and focus on. We have folks with disabilities, right, that we go out and focus on. Our LGBT community, right, uh, that we go out and focus on and provide leadership and development opportunities for those folks, right, um, et cetera. So we have... Uh, employee resource groups for almost any community you can think of. I think we have 40 of them, right? But we have specific focus on these on these areas that I've mentioned, right? And, it, and it's going it's going well. So the other piece is, is pipeline, right? I, one of the things that um, in in this um, this fund, this 300 million dollars, we call it diversity and technology fund, right? We've um, 
done those partnerships with uh, the schools that I talked to you about, right, with the one Oakland school specifically that we're working on. Our goal is to proliferate that across the United States, right, once we deem it successful, hopefully this year. Um, we have uh, relationships with many organizations like GEM and Great Minds in STEM where we contribute uh, money, scholarship money, right, to help folks uh, continue their education. Um, and w one of the cool things we did, we started last year, right, um, is once you get a scholarship from Intel Corporation, that scholarship comes with a letter of intent. In other words, you finish school, right, and you do everything you're supposed to do, you have a job at Intel, right? So I, I, I went to, um, I was in Pasadena in um, October, right, at the Great Minds in STEM conference. And I got to give eight students, right, uh, M, uh, masters and PhD students, um, scholarships, right, to fund their education for the next year, and also handed them a letter of intent, right, saying once you finish, you have a job at Intel. We'll figure out the specifics of where you want to work and what area and what location and all that, right? But you have a job at Intel Corporation, okay? That's our level of commitment to this, right? To this building the pipeline, okay? And then uh, industry leadership, right? I talked about, I talked about the um, supplier diversity uh, efforts that we have. I think a, a lot of folks in the industry are taking notice of that, right? Driving their spending in the same way. Um, we also have um, our capital investments, right? Uh, things that we do, uh, you wouldn't know it, but Intel is a huge construction company as well, right? So things that we do around all our capital investments um, on, on construction and equipment, right, for the next generation technologies, we've also made that same kind of commitment that we're going to work with diverse suppliers, right, as we go through um, building the technology. Okay? Any questions? We're getting close to the end. About the pipeline and hiring, so uh, suppose you have two candidates who are equally qualified. So do you choose diversity in that term? Like, uh, one might be majority which you already have in the company, the other might be a diverse, uh, different culture or different uh, gender. Yeah. So do you choose diversity in that? That's a great question. And a question that comes up a lot inside the company as well, right? And so um, I think, yeah, if you come across a situation where you have two candidates who are identical, right, bring the same exact talents to the table, same background, exactly what we're looking for, et cetera, uh, I'll be honest with you, we'd hire them both. But to answer your question, yeah, we would give that person in the, in the, in the diverse community that plus factor, right? We're saying all things being equal, we have a man and a woman here, we're probably going to hire the woman. Okay. Tell me. So, are you able to avoid that people who belong to underrepresented group get this label of you're just not as good enough, but you're going to hire because of you're underrepresented, so that they're treated as being hired under the lower standard? How do you avoid that? Yeah, it, it, it comes up, right? I, I, I don't know that. I, I think the, the way we combat that is we said we have never settled, right, for talent at Intel. We have never settled for talent. So, um, and, and people hear that, by the way, inside the company, right? We hire a black female, unfortunately she'll hear that. A, a female Hispanic, she'll hear that probably, right? Sad, but true, right? Um, so we combat it with, with data, right? We combat it with hiring good people. If you look at progression rates and promotion rates of each of the different um, ethnicities, which we look at, which I personally looked at, um, they're identical, right? If not even a little weighted more, right? I had this VP one time tell me, um, well, your answer should be, and I, th I think this was in Jeff saying, maybe you got hired because we were hiring too many of you, right? Because we overhired in that population, right? Probably not the case, but, but I, I think the key to all this is that we are hiring the best talent that we can find. Right? We are opening up what we're looking at, the schools we're looking at, where we're going to find these candidates, right? Um, and, and I will tell you that we will never settle. We will never settle um, for a tier two candidate, right? Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I, I tell you, those folks just wouldn't make it at Intel, 
once you get in the door, it, it's about results, right? And, and it's, it's pretty easy to weed out the underachievers, right? And so to, to, to get into Intel and to stay at Intel and to be successful at Intel, everyone's got to be pretty talented, right? And, we, and we're, we're, we're lucky to be able to attract really, really, really good people, really smart people. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's every, every country profile is very very different, right? Um, and there's there are some places where, um, for example, in Malaysia, right? And I'll say it because uh, it's very near and dear to my heart. I live there, right? And I even dealt with some um, diversity, quote unquote, issues there. So uh, in Malaysia. If you, if you just look at the, the island of Penang, right? The, the, the island is made up of Malays, right? The local people there. There's a, there's a heavy population of Chinese Malay, right? People who have moved from China down to Southeast Asia. And then you also have a, a huge Indian community contingent as well, right? And we do a really, really good job of hiring the Chinese, uh, uh, Mal Chinese Malay folks, a good job of hiring the Indian Malay folks, not so great a job of hiring the locals, right? And so what we do there, um, and that's probably the place where I think we've made the most progress outside the U.S., it is, is almost identical to what we're doing here, right? Go out and talk with the universities about what you're looking for in terms of talent. Go out, work with the high schools, introduce uh, pre-college students to STEM, and STEM degrees and STEM technology and STEM careers, right? Uh, it, 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 that's what it takes, right? And, and it's uh, um, e even, even in um, when I was there, all right, and, and I remember we were looking for some uh, specific hires when I was there, finance hires, right? It was really, really, really hard to find qualified candidates in those minority populations. Right, really, really hard, um, and so you do have to really, really work that entire ecosystem, like we talked about. Right, you do have to work with the high schools and the, even the even the grade schools um, to make it happen, and, it, and it's investment. Right, it takes time. Right, these fruits that that the fruits of our efforts. You know, I'll probably be retired at least by then to see those uh, come to fruition. Right. But it's an investment. It's an investment in the right place. I strongly believe it's in the right place, right? And um, it, it, it's what needs to happen. Great question. Any other questions? Hi. So one of my questions is, um, with all of your experience and diverse team inclusion, from a corporate standpoint, how would you kind of define the two? So, so many times we're kind of lumped together. Mm -hmm. um, Good question. Yeah, you're right. They have been clumped together, um, even historically, right? And, and simply, simply put is, is uh, you know, diversity is getting the mix right. Inclusion is making that, that mix work at its highest potential, right? So what do you do, right? So in inclusion is about every single day making every single employee feel like he or she belongs, like he or she can be their best self, at Intel or, or any high tech company, right? And, and brings their best self every single day because they're so motivated and so passionate about what they do, right? Uh, and, and once again, the diversity part is hard, getting the mix right is hard. The inclusion part is because you're changing hearts and minds of, of people who have been around a long time, right? You're changing the hearts and minds. That's, that's the tougher string to pull. Good question. Yeah. And you also mentioned you don't ever settle for cheap food. So is the retention at the end of that progression because of the frozen middle and it's not being able to succeed? Yeah, so so why do we lose why why do we lose folks, right? Why do we lose folks is kind of your question. Um, I guess I can't blame it just on that frozen middle, but I can probably point a lot of the uh, Henry's opinion to that. People leave because they feel isolated, right? They feel alone. They look around, 
They don't see anybody that looks like them, right? That's why people leave companies, right? People leave because they don't have a good, solid relationship with their manager, right? You hear all the time, people don't leave companies, they leave managers, right? And so um, I think those are the two, and probably the third reason is people leave because they don't see a career progression path for them, right? They look up and they don't see anybody that looks like them, they look up and et cetera, right? Um, those are the reasons why. Bottom line, that, those are the reasons why, period. Um, we may even hear different stories of, oh, I had a family that's pulling me back to the East Coast or whatever. But at the end of the day, right, that's what it is. So building that inclusive environment, um, training managers on how to be more inclusive, getting our, our, our senior leaders to be a more diverse mix of employees is great too. Let me tell you something. On the way down here, just on the way down here, right now, we announced a whole bunch of new vice presidents, appointed new vice presidents in the company, right? And I belong on the Intel um, Black Leadership Council, and I belong in the Intel Hispanic Leadership Council, right? And I probably have now 80 emails from these folks congratulating uh, folks within the Black Leadership Council and Hispanic Leadership Council on their appointment to vice presidency, all right? And I'll be honest with you, 10 years ago, maybe you'd have gotten one, right? And now we have several Hispanic vice presidents, several um, African-American vice presidents. And, and, and we're not done yet. We're not satisfied yet, right? But we're making progress, for sure. And, and, and as you saw, BK, our boss, believes that very strongly. So once again, that's why people leave. Isolation, right? Uh, they feel all alone. They don't see a career path and they don't have a good relationship with their management. I should have made that one of the questions. <laughs> Other questions? Sure. So does Intel see itself as uh, kind of a, a leader within the, the push to be more diverse and inclusive? Um, are there any companies that you kind of hold as the standard, or do you see yourself as the standard? We are the standard. We are the standard, absolutely, right? It, it is, it is um, we, we are public with this and as public as we are with this because we want our fellow you know, high-tech companies to come along with us. It's good for the industry, right? It's good for innovation. It's good for technology, period, right? Um, but, but I will tell you that, that um, there aren't folks nearly as public <coughs> with their data or as um, forthright with what we're doing about it and, and what still needs to be done about it is Intel. We are the leader. Right? Just like we were the leader, have been the leader in high tech, we, we've taken a stance and BK has taken a stance that we are absolutely the leader here. We have to be the, the, the beacon that folks run to, right? Because it's the right thing to do um, for many reasons, right? And the business case we talked about. And I don't mean to seem immodest, but there's no one even close to doing what we're doing in the space. Other questions? I think we're about out of time. So if you want to learn more, uh, you're welcome to go and visit our website uh, around diversity. It talks about some of the programs going on there. Um, you're more than welcome to, to attend that. I think if there's uh, no more questions, you guys had a lot of great questions. Um, any, any last questions from anyone? Okay, I just thank you for your time and thanks for inviting me here. It was great. Thank you.